Welcome to the 10 Minute Treasure. My name is Jeff Pospisil. In this video, I'm going to go over the church's balance sheet. I have noticed as I've started teaching, and I've only been teaching for two months, that a lot of people just do not understand finances. And I took it for granted because I've been around accountants for so long that everybody understands what a balance sheet is. Uh, and sometimes, by the way, in the church world, we call it a statement of financial position or maybe a treasurer's report or something like that. But I want to help anybody that is struggling with this. And also for those of you that do understand it, hopefully give you some language or some tools to help others understand it that maybe they're struggling with. Let's start off with what are the basic parts of the balance sheet? So in your balance sheet, you're gonna see assets and assets are anything that the church owns. Uh, a lot of times this little, um, we, we mainly worry about the checking, we mainly worry about any investments, but it could also include the building or a vehicle or land or musical equipment or, or anything of that nature. So it's anything that the church owns can end up on the balance sheet as an asset. The next thing is liabilities. And a liability is anything that the church owes. So anything that the church owes. So it's a debt. It could be taxes that you've withheld from your employees that you owe to the IRS. It could be a mortgage. It could be um, sometimes uh, some churches use accounts payable. So they'll put a bill into the system. And while that bill is in the system, it shows up as an account payable. And once it's paid out, then that goes away. And the last thing is equity or net assets. And this is kind of a confusing section, but I think about it like this. It's restrictions on ownership. So it's looking at uh, your net, your assets minus your liabilities. And what part of this is unrestricted so that the church could use it any way it wants? What part of this is restricted by donors? What part of this is maybe restricted by the board? So that's what your equity section could tell you is the restriction on what we call the net assets, the assets minus the liabilities. All right, let's start by looking at an example balance sheet. And I have a fake one I made up for Parkston United Methodist Church. So I guess if you're from Parkston and you want to start up a United Methodist Church, go for it. And here is a fake balance sheet for you. Um, but let's start looking at first the asset section. And in this fake balance sheet, you can see a bunch of bank accounts to start it. So we have all the way from general checking, uh, money market savings, memorial savings, and a couple other checking accounts. A lot of times a church would split, um, split out their money like this in order to better keep track of it. So uh, to keep your memorials safe from your mission, safe from your trustees, um, and then the money market and the general checking might be unrestricted or might be maybe uh, part of it, but at least this way you keep it separate, especially if you're not using your equity section well to track these different restrictions. That would be one way of doing it. Let's go ahead and go down. And then we have some investment accounts. So these are uh, less, less liquid. So they're a little bit harder to get to than a savings account or a bank account. So they have an endowment somewhere as well as a scholarship fund and some kind of major maintenance reserve. One of the things I suggest that people do is actually put where or how they are invested. So I'm just gonna say this one's with the Dakota's Methodist Foundation. You could just put something real short like that and maybe put this one over at Edward Jones. And then let's put maybe another one with the Dakota's Methodist Foundation. Um, that just makes it just a quick reminder about where these are actually at and maybe it'll give a little insight on how they are actually invested. Um, that's an important thing, by the way. You, you want to invest long-term funds for the long-term, so endowments for the long-term, reserves for the long-term. Uh, one thing you might also see then for some of you is underneath these current assets, you might see long-term assets. Uh, this is not as common. I think it's a little bit difficult, but you might see the building, um, the, the land, equipment, Things of that nature might be found there. And I, I always struggle with this because it's easy to mess up your balance sheet because we usually don't track depreciation in the church world. We usually don't 
Um, we're usually not that consistent about even adding and removing our fixed assets. So a lot of times I actually don't use this that often. Let's go to the liability section next. And for this church, I can tell that they are a cash basis accounting church because there are no liabilities. So liabilities happen when you enter a bill, but it's not yet paid. So it might be taxes, it might be accounts payable again. And so you might see something like this. Um, also, there's no mortgage here either. Sometimes, well, I, I won't even say sometimes, I find it common that a church will have a mortgage and there will not be, it won't show up on the balance sheet. So uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and make a couple of them up. I'm just gonna copy and paste and enter something in here. So um, just so you could see what it's like, by the way, I will put in a sample QuickBooks chart of accounts in the description just for you to use if you want. And this one, I'm just gonna put 2100 accounts payable. And then for this one, I'm gonna go also, I want to add another one for, um, let me see, what would be another one? Like probably taxes payable. Uh, if you have any employees, you might have some withholding for so, uh, payroll taxes or federal withholding. And then this last one, I'm just gonna make into a mortgage. And that might be what it ends up looking like. So if you don't have a mortgage on your church and it's not showing up anywhere, that would be something I would ask your whoever's keeping your books to actually add. And then anyway, that's that's just a sample. And by the way, I'm going to put this sample in the description as well as that chart of account. All right, now we're to the equity section. And I like to track my donor restricted funds and my board designated funds and my unrestricted in my equity section. First of all, if you just set up QuickBooks, it, normally this is the one that uh, has a balance. I like to zero that out. So I like to... Uh, Go ahead and do a journal entry to put it in all the right places and anything that's left over goes into retained earnings because retained earnings is unrestricted. That is your prior year operating earnings. And so if I add up net income plus retained earnings, this is assuming that you are just tracking your operating income and expenses and, uh, and the expense side and your donor restricted here, but that adds up to about 5,000. Yet I see in my general checking and money market that it's over 6,000. So what's the difference? Well, we will get to that, but first we're gonna to go to board designated. So this is designated funds are anything that the board sets up that uh, what they designate, they could also undesignate. This is different from a donor restriction. What the board designates, they can undesignate. And so they designated 43,000 for this reserve and put it in a separate investing account and it matches that number there. So when that goes up or down, both of them should go up or down. They also have $12,000 in trustee checking, but in the designated fund, they only have 4,000. That's because they also have some donor restricted funds of 8,000 there. So you just have to add those two up. Sometimes I'd also make sure it says trustees new refund, just so I'm clear and so I keep remembering to match those up. Um, but that is the, that way I'm accounting for all my board designated here. And let's go ahead and look up at the donor restricted funds. So donor restricted, they cannot be changed unless you have consent of the donor, the person that actually gave it. I, um, yeah, there's these two uh, endowment and scholarship funds that match up perfectly to our investment accounts. Again, when they go up, the other side should go, the equity side should go up and then we also have these memorial accounts for $1,500 and that matches up with the memorial savings. And then we also have the missions, which is $750 and the $750 should match up with missions checking. And again, these should always tie out if you're, if you're keeping the separate accounts. If you only had one checking account, then it really wouldn't matter that they tie out. But if you are keeping separate bank accounts, then they should. And then the last one we have is this fundraisers and food pantry. And then if you combine that with the retained earnings and the net income, we actually get our amount that we need for 
6,377. And that's just how this all ties out. So it shows you of all of our assets, how they're broken out. And though it might look like we have 6,000, we actually have some of that that is actually donor restricted. And so that's why it's important to keep track of this. Um, by the way, uh, if you do have capital assets like fixed assets, I normally like to make the total for whatever fixed assets you have, put that in an account and call it something like investment in capital assets or investment in fixed assets. And that way it doesn't look like you have a whole lot of, of unrestricted money because it's actually invested in your building. Unless you're willing to cash in your building, building to pay your bills, um, I would not include that. But that would, that would add up to whatever you have in fixed assets. All right. Hopefully that was an adequate explanation of the balance sheet and gave you a little bit better understanding. I want to leave you with a couple questions though to ask. And first of all, after hearing that, are there things from your own balance sheet that are missing? Does your church have a mortgage, but it's not showing up anywhere? Does your church have an investment account? I know of a number of churches they'll have that kind of quasi secret account that everybody knows about and but it's not showing up anywhere and so then there are some people that really don't know what it is or and a lot of us that don't know the amount of what's in there so i just encourage you that if there is those important details that are missing put them on there i'm not so much worried about the fixed assets but i am concerned about all the the debts and all the investment accounts especially the next one is how is your money being invested uh, i i especially for long-term money if you have scholarships or endowment funds that are sitting in a savings account or in a CD, that anything that's long-term, meaning five years plus that it, you hope to, it sits there, should be invested in some kind of a mutual fund. And I strongly encourage you to look at the Methodist Foundation, invite them in, talk to them, see their returns. You will be pleasantly impressed. And especially at this season where we're, I think we're in a recession and it's a good time to buy cheap and it'll grow fast for you. The third one is how often are your investments and your debts actually updated? It, it can be complicated, a complicated entry or just sometimes even forgotten to update those. And they can sit around for a while at the same balance for, for a full year. So I would like to encourage you to, to ask whoever's keeping your books to update that at least quarterly. And that would at least give you an idea of where they're sitting. And the last one is, um, can you tell how much is actually unrestricted? Because it really is an ethical violation to, to dip into your donor restricted money in order to pay your bills. And I've seen that happen. I've, I think I've probably been pretty close to there uh, in some of the churches that I've served. And it's not a comfortable feeling, um, it's a false cushion when you're using donor restricted money to help cash flow your current operations. So you do need to know that amount because uh, that donor restricted money, if, if you're not able to, op to fulfill that donor's request, uh, th that's going to be bad for your church. I don't know how else to say it. It's not a good thing. All right, that does bring us to the end. Next week, by the way, I'm going to talk about the income statement and hopefully bring some insights there. Last week, if you missed it, I talked about the executive summary, and that can be a very good tool for you to communicate to the board. All right, until next time, I, by the way, I encourage you to hit the links, uh, like, subscribe, share if you found this to be helpful, and God bless you.